and when we are trying to assess disability rapid neurological examination with gca scoring and pupillary examination is very very important if the patient is conscious now we should ask uh, the patient about his allergies or any vomiting history and a past medical illness uh, and we should also uh, ask for uh, you know any mechanism of injury if the patient is able to uh, uh, brief us about the findings so the physical examination of a neurological assessment will help us which part of the brain may be affected if the patient has frontal lobe involvement there may be a change in the behavior or the patient will have you know uh, irritability or agitation or he may be violent if the if there is an injury to the parietal lobe there may be a cognitive dysfunction or visual difficulties or patient may have dyspraxia and disorientation topographical disorientation if the patient has a non dominant dom, non dominant parietal lobe involvement he will have left sided neglect or anosmia uh, anosmia uh, sorry uh, uh, anosognosia if the patient has a tem uh, dominant temporal lobe involvement uh, there he will have uh, language difficulties and if the patient has bilateral medial temporal lobe involvement he will have amnestic features so this is how we should examine the patient all the clothes should be removed and even minute examination will uh, give you a uh, idea about the possible life threatening injury so it is very important that detailed brief uh, rapid uh, investigation of the patient examination of the patient from head to toe uh, is very very important and you know and we should also make sure that the patient should be warmed adequately after the examination and uh, lastly when we have done the primary survey the full catheterization should be done because urine output is one of the indicator of adequacy of resuscitation but the full catheter would be contraindicated if there is blood through the urethral meatus um, which gives you possible clue that there is urethral injury and the possibility of uh, pelvic fracture so uh, uh, if we have such a doubt the retrograde urethrogram should be done before passing the uh, foley catheter or sometimes if the foley catheterization is not possible a suprabiotic cystostomy uh, cystotomy is good enough to monitor urine output and later on uh, the urethral injuries can be uh, you know repaired so these are some of the uh, signs of urethral transaction blood at the meatus on parietal examination the uh, prostate will be high riding and uh, you know perineal and scrotal hematoma will give you tell, uh, clue about possible uh, you know uh, urethral injury and if there is a pelvic fracture you should have a strong suspicion of a pelvic uh, fracture and we should also put a gastric uh, tube rail tube and the rail tube uh, can be done uh, to prevent the aspiration risk and the decompression of the stomach Uh, uh will help you to prevent uh, aspiration risk and then the resuscitation should go hand in hand as i have told you during primary survey so for airway the resuscitation is supplemental oxygenation for breathing the resuscitation is putting the patient on ventilator or oxygen support circulation the resuscitation is hemorrhage control and for disability uh, limitation and neurological assessment immediate intervention and immediate investigation through with the help of ct scan and decompression craniectomy for possible intracranial bleeding or traumatic brain injury is the resuscitation so fluid therapy has to be judicious from uh, from uh, previous uh, guidelines the uh, the new guidelines have recommended that the resuscitation should be as conservative as possible uh, which is keeping the hemodynamics intact and keeping the mean blood pressure uh, around 65 which is good enough for organ perfusion but if the patient is elderly uh, more than 70 years of age or so uh, the the systolic blood pressure should be more than 110 and if the patient is between 50 to 60 years of age between uh, this middle aged group the systolic blood pressure should be more than 100 so uh, they they have targeted the atls guidelines have targeted the systolic blood pressure uh, which will keep the uh, perfusion of the organs intact and when we are giving resuscitation we need to remember the resuscitation the initial resuscitation should be 1 liter of crystalloid but blood should be replaced for blood uh, like if the patient has received lot of fluids more than 2 liters 3 liters 
it will ultimately lead to uh, dilution of the coagulation factor, dilution of the platelets and thrombocytopenia and then patient will bleed torrentially. So, uh, overzealous fluid resuscitation is also harmful and targeting normal blood pressure is also very, very important. We are not chasing uh, for supranormal blood pressure because in trauma patient, if you try to maintain high blood pressure, the patient will bleed more. So, if patient doesn't have head injury or patient doesn't have any cardiac dysfunction or ischemic heart disease, systolic blood pressure of 90 is good enough, especially when we are transporting the patient from one place to other, other like other hospital. So, while transport, it is, it is necessary that we should keep the blood pressure between 90, systolic 90 by 60 or so, so, so that the bleeding will not be torrential. And uh, uh, overzealous fluid resuscitation will not dilute the coagulation factors because sometimes the co clot may be sitting on the bleeding area and we give a lot of fluids, the clot may get dislodged. So, rapid and overzealous resuscitation should be avoided and permissive hypotension is also recommended for those patients who doesn't have head injury or patient doesn't have heart ailments or pregnancy. So, so, permissive hypotension is recommended. And as far as the fluid resuscitation is concerned, one liter of uh, crystalloid is good enough, warm crystalloid is good enough for initial resuscitation. Um, but we should remember that if uh, X amount of blood is lost, that much should be replaced with the blood. But when we are giving blood transfusions, uh, now, naturally nowadays, we have packed red blood cells. It, it doesn't contain coagulation factors or it doesn't contain platelets. So, so that's why when, when we are replacing blood with one PRBC, then one bag of FFP and one bag of platelet uh, should be given. Otherwise, there will be platelet deficiency and coagulation factor deficiency. So, one is to one is to one rule is, uh, you know, advocated for blood transfusion. Uh, and when the patient is in shock, uh, and the patient is not able to maintain uh, adequate oxygen level. Uh, so, it is, uh, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is a good clue that the hemoglobin is low. So, the hemoglobin is carrier of oxygen. If the hemoglobin is low, so no matter how much oxygen we increase, it is not going to increase the saturation. So, so in a shock situation, uh, it is very important that the oxygen delivery should be improved with blood transfusion uh, with packed red blood cell transfusion and uh, in traumatic uh, 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 situations uh, shock is because of the hemorrhage so control of the bleeding and uh, definitive intervention for the bleeding is the key to uh, 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 reduce further bleeding so there are different types of shock i would like to uh, you know highlight in brief so, as far as uh, you know, traumatic brain injury or uh, a trauma is concerned, uh, it is basically a, a hypovolemic shock because of the loss of volume. And uh, uh, apart from that, uh, the other shocks may be coexistent together. Like patient may have hypoglycemia, patient may develop sepsis or septic shock. But in immediate, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 immediately after uh, uh, injury, uh, it is very unlikely that the patient will develop septic shock. Sepsis usually develops third to fourth day onward. But if the wound is contaminated, this patient is likely to develop septic shock later on. So, antibiotic supplementation uh, should be given to patients who have open wound. So, generally, if the wound is um, less than 10 millimeters, uh, so basically, uh, these patients uh, open wound, so gram positive cover with the antibiotics is very, very uh, much sufficient. Uh, but if the wound is open and contaminated, uh, uh, along with the gram positive, gram negative antibiotic cover is also very, very important. So um, there are antibiotic guidelines recommended by the ATLS and that should be, uh, you know, advocated. So as well as I already discussed, uh, hypovolemic shock, so, the class of shock is like class 1, class 2, class 3, class 4. So, basically in class 1 shock, the blood loss is around 15 percent and class 2, 15 to 30 percent. And in class 3, the blood loss is around 30 to 40 percent. And in class 4, the blood loss is uh, more than 40 percent. Uh, 
So whereas in the class one and the class two, the heart rate may not change, but in class three and class four, the heart rate would definitely change. And blood pressure is also near normal in class one and class two, but in class three and class four, there will be hypotension. So pulse pressure, uh, generally in hypovolemic shock, the, there is low pulse pressure. The difference between the systolic and diastolic blood pressure is low. So that uh, low pulse pressure is generally seen with class three and class four shock. It may not be identified in class one, but it may be present in class two shock. So there will be no respiratory compromise with uh, class one, class two, but definitely there will be a respiratory compromise or uh, respiratory insufficiency in patients with a class four shock. And uh, ATLS has uh, you know, advocated best deficit monitoring in patients with the shock. In the class one, the base deficit would not be, um, you know, substantial, but as the class increases in class three and class four, there will be severe metabolic acidosis. So we need to uh, see which patients need blood transfusions. And generally, class three and class four patients will definitely need blood transfusion. Class four, uh, severe hypovolemic shock will need massive blood transfusion. Whereas class one and class two, uh, the blood transfusion is usually not indicated. So the radiological investigation that are very important in trauma patient is X-ray, uh, X-ray of the chest and pelvis and cervical spine uh, uh, X-ray is also recommended. So but new ATLS guidelines have not recommended cervical spine X-ray if, uh, uh, if the spine tenderness is not there or patient's neck movements are free or clinical examination is of uh, giving enough idea that you know, there is no possibility of cervical spine injury. The cervical spine X-ray is not mandatory in primary surgery, but X-ray chest and X-ray pelvis is mandatory. It should be done in primary, at the end of the primary survey. Diagnostic peritoneal lavage is not recommended in ATLS guideline because it is associated with uh, you know ambiguity. The fluid may go into the false uh, spaces. And the returning fluid that may be aspirated may give false idea about the peritoneal hemorrhage. Uh, so that's why peritoneal lavage, and it is also associated with the chance of infection. So diagnostic peritoneal lavage is replaced with FAST, where a focused ultrasound is done to look for intra-abdominal bleeding. The four areas of the abdomen is inspected with the ultrasound. And depending upon the bleeding in the, uh, these four areas, and uh, considering the hemodynamics of the patient, the surgical intervention may be required. 